Greetings, Midwest Remarks viewers. This is Carlos Garrido. I'm joined today by my co-host and comrade, Eddie Smith, who will introduce our discussion for... Yes, hello, everyone. Um, we're here today to his 1993 text, Towards a New Socialism. Dr. Cockshot is an economist and computer scientist. His best known books on economics are Towards a New Socialism, which has been translated into Spanish, Italian, Chinese, Czech, and Russian. Uh, and the 2019 text, How the World Works, which we hope to have a discussion about at some point as well. Um, in computing, he has worked on cellular automata machines, database machines, video encoding, and 3D TV. In economics, he works on Marxist value theory and the theory of socialist economy. So thank you very much for being with us today, Dr. Cox. Hi, hi. Mm -hmm. So you published Towards the New Socialism in 1993, which was a couple of years after the fall of the Soviet Union. So this is a period where um, even amongst many previous socialists, there is a Fukuyamaist pessimism, um, which saw the capitalism, which saw capitalism as the end of history. Um, and this created a pipeline to social democracy, a tendency you rightly push back against. Um, and the first question we'd like to ask is, how uh, was the initial reception of your text? Um, and briefly, how has that reception changed over the years? Well, you've got to realize we actually wrote it before the collapse of the Soviet Union. OK, um, and our first plan was to get it published in Russia and in Hungary. And Alan was in Russia at the time and was trying to get someone who would publish it there. Um, but it wasn't until just as he was about to leave the country, he was there for a few months, uh, that he actually met anyone, any economists who were sympathetic to planning. Because by that stage, the economists he was meeting were new school people who were Gorbachevites or actually free market economists and it wasn't till the very end that he met any um you know pro planning it to do anything i went to hungary to go and see Zsuzsa ferge who had published a good book on the building of socialism in hungary which was translated into english and she was also had written on welfare economics and stuff like that. Uh, I went and met her and discovered she had turned into a, a social democrat as well. Uh, there was no chance of getting it published uh, in Hungary. So basically our plan had been to have it as an intervention in the East, but we the, the contacts we were able to establish before things got too, too far gone there were all with people who who changed their politics and become uh, social democrats at best uh, and weren't interested in what we were saying. Um, and the same thing affected the original Western publisher we had, which was Verso Books or, or New Left Books as it then was as they had a contract with us but as soon as the wall came down oh no it doesn't fit our current publishing uh plan uh we won't publish it so we had to search around for a couple of years to find someone who would and the only people we could find actually were left social democrats from the um the institute for workers control and the um who were on the left of the Labour Party representation in the European Parliament. And uh, Ken Coates, who was a left Labour MP in the European Parliament, got it published for us. But at that point, it was very... inappropriate, inopportune time to publish something. We didn't really start making much of an impact until the end of the 90s, I think it was, or the start of the 2000s, when people from other countries started to want to translate it. First, I think it was Czechs, then Swedes, then Germans, 
And then we started getting invitations to go and speak in Latin America about it um, in Bolivia and Venezuela and stuff. So the no real impact within Britain at all, because British politics had moved so far to the right. Insofar as we made an impact, we made an impact in countries where left-wing politics was progressing, which was basically South America, or in countries where there was still a relatively strong or relict Communist Party or um, left social democrat movement. I Scandinavia, Czechoslovakia, Germany. It was a D it was the DKP people who got it published in Germany, people associated with the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, uh, of Czech Communist Party in, in Prague. Um, ex Finnish mountain in Sweden, the people from the, um, I suppose you could call it not quite the Maoist left, but the le new left or Maoist left in China, people like that. And the big it became after we started putting it on the web for free. Uh, and set under a GNU license, say, so anyone could download it and use it. That's very interesting. Uh, since we're uh, since we're short on time, we don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I, I, in your text, you argue that the computation of labor values for a whole economy is now feasible in a few minutes using modern supercomputers. Considering the immense development of technology in the last three decades, how has such uh, development made macroeconomic strategic and detailed production planning easier? And has it made it harder in any way? No, it's made it much easier. Basically, it's, it's reduced the cost of the machines you would need to uh, use for it. I mean, a single uh, Intel Xeon Platinum is way more powerful than the machine, the supercomputers we were taking as our benchmark. Now, a Xeon Platinum chip costs about twenty-three thousand dollars, so it's an expensive chip. But what you, what we were talking about, multi-million-dollar machines, is now tens of thousand. That the sort of thing that's you know trivial for a government department. Interesting. And, and Stigan also argued in the in the book that the Internet has spawned a sort of cooperative culture that's essentially communistic, whether or not the participants would be happy to accept that description. Um, so after three decades, uh, we're now seeing massive monopolization, surveillance and censorship from these giant tech monopolies who manage the Internet. Um, so how has this affected the Internet? And do you think it, it has stripped the, um, the sphere of human interaction that once made it um, a sort of communistic space? Well, the there's still a large amount of software that is by people just for the love of developing of developing the software, which is essentially unalienated labor. And a lot of the, the internet lives on that unalienated labor. The, um, the Linux servers are a product of that. The, um, Apache web servers are a product of that. An enormous amount of enthusiasm, which people put into, um, sort of novel devices like this, uh, Pine phone, uh, which is an attempt to get away from the Apple Google monopoly of of uh, devices. It's it's my experience of it since I got it is it's not doesn't have great battery life yet, uh, but the 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 effort that's put into the operating systems of that is done by volunteers. 
and people are putting an effort in to try and break the control of the um, the big monopolies on the, on the technology. I mean, the the biggest obstacle, obviously, is the fact that if you're going to use a machine, you're almost bound to use something built using either a, a British designed ARM processor or an American designed Intel processor. And those things nearly all have some kind of uh, management processor on them, which is a backdoor that threatens uh, the security of the device. And therefore, if you want something that, wh whose security isn't threatened by such a backdoor, you're going to need some kind of um, open source core, like a RISC-V core or something. Uh, and before I retired, we put some effort into trying to design protocols by which you could have Trojan free architectures for such um, open source core, much harder to get um, Trojans and viruses onto them. Fascinating parts of your text is your usage of Aristotle's politics in the discussion on democracy. For Aristotle, as you rightly point out, democracy concerns the rule of the poor or the common folk. Today, democracy for the bourgeois mind is almost synonymous with selective elections and voting. And we might add that for most socialists, they have the same conception. However, the conception in ancient Greece was that filling the filling of positions by lot is democratic and by selective elections is oligarchic. Thereby, it was conceived that there was an inherent antagonism with democracy and elections, at least as, as we think of it today. Can you talk about the importance of Aristotle's assessment of democracy for socialists today? And how would this Grecian democratic filling of positions by lot look like in a modern context? Okay, well, it's one of the biggest frauds that has been ideologically carried out over the last couple of hundred years is to label a system which its founders were quite aware was an aristocratic system as democracy. The, the founders of the US Constitution knew their Aristotle and they knew they weren't constant constructing a democracy. Um, but it's been labeled as a democracy and this has had an enormous deleterious effect on the working class movement so that even the most radical ideas in it which is of a soviet form of government a council form of government is a second-hand borrowing of marx's reports of what the communards did and the communards were prudenists so it's the prudenist platform uh, that gets translated and the prudenist platform is now actually the official structure of the uh, constitution of china for example the system of indirect elections like that and that system of indirect elections actually makes it very easy for a new educated or middle class to come and dominate something which was originally set up as a working class form of politics. Because with each level of elections, the, the advantage is that someone who is a member of the apparatus or a member of the professional classes has grows. Now this can be mitigated in one party states. It can be mitigated the way the USSR did it under Brezhnev by actually setting social class quotas for the candidates that were put forward. But as soon as the social class uh, quotas were dropped under Gorbachev and anyone could put themselves forward as a candidate, you saw a disproportionate number, firstly, of men being elected compared to before and you saw a, a hugely disproportionate number of people from the professional managerial classes being elected to the supreme soviet under gorbachev now that didn't completely convert it 
into a pro-capitalist assembly so that the, 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 the Russian Soviet still had to be shelled by Yeltsin because it was still not actually pro-capitalist enough. But the the natural mechanism that um, Aristotle described with their training in rhetoric and uh, uh, presentation have an advantage operated even within the constitution of the that had been designed to be a worker state. The only thing that kept it was a worker state was the Communist Party setting quotas on the selection of candidates. If once that was dropped, the the mechanism of it immediately shifted it to the right and you got a dominance by the professional middle classes and obviously the dominance by the professional middle classes and higher not just professional middle classes the uh, lower ranks of the millionaire class is overwhelming in the united states the majority of the u.s senators are millionaires And that's in a country like the USA, where the most savings have negative savings, owe more than they um, uh, than they have in cash. That's interesting. It's interesting to hear you talk about these these ideas that you laid out in the book, um, uh, and applying them to modern China and, and our modern um, situation. And, and in that context, I want to ask: now that we're coming up uh, on the thirtieth anniversary of towards a new socialism um since the time that the books come out we've seen the emergence of various post-soviet socialist projects in latin america like the bolivarian revolution in venezuela uh, the movement towards socialism in bolivia the sandinistas in nicaragua um, among others um so a lot of these struggles identify themselves as 21st century socialism um, which is something that you talked about in your book um, and they paint it as an alternative to both European social democracy and the, uh, the socialism that ultimately dissolved in Eastern Europe. Um, so what do you think about these 21st century movements towards socialism? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a question. I mean, typically social democratic movements, the, the social conditions which gave rise to social democracy in Europe in the late 19th century now exist in South America in many countries and circumstances. Now the Bolivarians go beyond that in two respects. Um, one of them is their care to ensure the loyalty of the military. And then is the institution of the mass democracy. But the this is still relatively limited, and you still get a relatively professional political elite within these societies. So you get a a, uh, you're bound to get a class conflict. In terms of the economic structure, they are, none of them are more socialist really than classical social democratic states were. They, the share of the socialist plan sector of the economy is small. They, the, land has not been national in any of these states other than cuba the i mean the, the, where there was a revolution but in um venezuela bolivia there's been no seizure of the law they haven't even got as far as implementing
they are at the level or of what the British and Swedish Social Democrats achieved. So it's by the standards of the early 21st century, this is very radical. But if you were to go back to the 1950s, this wouldn't have seemed radical at all. This would have what was ca categorized as the middle way, the third way. or at least whatever party theorists of the early 1950s called the third way. Just to pick up on that one, do you think that I would make uh, what, what they're conceiving as a movement towards, towards socialism uh, more robust in, in the battle against imperialism? Because uh, some of the arguments that are made for why they don't take it to like more radical conclusions is that, well, it's, they exist within a context where there, there's constant internal and external pressure from imperialism. So how do you think that the implementation of more radical politics in these areas uh, would be affected if, uh, uh, or how do you think imperialism and the struggle against imperialism in these areas would be affected if more radical politics uh, were to occur? I'm not sure that it directly affects it. I mean, this is an internal element of the class struggle against the, the, the old landlord and farm owning class still exists in Bolivia, in Venezuela. It hasn't been got rid of. And that social class is the basis for the counter-revolutionary movements. Unless they're economically liquidated, the, the ability of the um, foreign powers to stimulate uh, attempts at coups remains. I think you're really right. Uh, Eddie and I published a paper together uh, about a year ago now, precisely making a, a similar conclusion to that, which is that the socialist states which have been able to do that have been the only ones that have been really robust uh, that the internal conflicts that take place when we don't expropriate the lands of the old owners uh, make it so that it's always wobbling uh, the, the what they're claiming to be a construction of socialism um, so we don't want to it's not just that it's, it's the, their, their economic development can't proceed rapidly you 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 absolutely need to eliminate the share of the surplus that's going in rent from these economies. The, if China had not nationalized the land, there would have been no chance of the rapid economic development that China has achieved. I think you're um, So is, is there anything you would like to plug uh, or, or promote uh, before we go? What would I plug? Uh, well, if people don't watch my YouTube channel, perhaps you could tell them where to, to catch it. It's under my name. Uh, and I've got lots of talks on topics like this, including one. Yeah, yeah, I've been enjoying those videos a, great a lot. Channel. I know Eddie and I follow it. Yeah, I recommend really illuminating for me. Um, really appreciate your work. We'll link both your uh, YouTube channel and uh, your blog site to the uh, description of the video so that people can check yeah. that out. I, I'm afraid uh, I haven't great. been writing so much for the blog site recently because I've been busy writing two books and that's <laughs> that, that's taken more time than the blogs have had. I can imagine, yeah. Um, well, thank you for coming on. We hope to have you again uh, at some point soon, hopefully to, to talk about how the world works. Um, so thanks again for coming on. Okay, thanks for talking to me. Appreciate it, thank you. Thank you.